cartoon. If you ever watch Bugs Bunny, you might recall this cartoon. So we're on to Luke 17. And uh, no, we didn't bring that, that fish, that forgetful fish today. <gasps> what was her name? Dory. And we never brought that minion either. What was his name? I already know his name. I'm told his name is Carl, but we're going to learn a little bit more about um, that a little later on. So Luke 17, well, why didn't we bring them? Well, they're a little spooked by these, this, props, this prop that we have today. They're a little spooked. Um, okay, and we'll find out about that. In this chapter, our brave commentator, whose name is Liefeld again, he takes issue with the NIV translation. <gasps> yes, imagine that. He takes issue with the NIV translation. And that's a traitorous move <laughs> because uh, it was the NIV that published his commentary in the first place. But still, our modern day commentator takes issue with the account of Jesus telling the Pharisees in this chapter that the kingdom of God is within them. In verse 21 insisting that the kingdom of God was not within them, since most of those Pharisees were unbelievers. Therefore, the Holy Spirit did not dwell in those Pharisees. And he has a good point. And that's the same point that I made with Luke 16, verse 15, that Jesus was mocking them. Likewise, our default commentator, the guy we always go to, John Calvin, <clears throat> also jumps on that account, claiming that within them, comment, was some blessed assurance of the Holy Spirit being within the disciples rather than within the Pharisees. Despite Luke clearly saying that comment was addressed to the Pharisees in verse 20. But I would have to respectfully disagree with Calvin that the Holy Spirit was even within the disciples. I would disagree since it seems highly unlikely that the Holy Spirit was in Judas Iscariot at that point. And in fact, I don't think the Holy Spirit was within any of the disciples till quite some time later. We'll find that later on too. Uh, you can see John 16 as a reference there too. And Calvin continues that those Pharisees were mocking Jesus. Yeah, right on, Calvin. You nailed that one. So Christ now disregards those dogs. And he was addressing his disciples instead. Well, in doing so, that Christ was indirectly reproving the stupidity of the Pharisees. Yes, Calvin said that. The stupidity of the Pharisees. He's using the same approach that I took with the shrewd dude of our previous chapter. And following through on that backhand approach, Christ finished his reproof by indirectly calling those Pharisees <gasps> vultures. Yeah, vultures. Sort of like this. Oh. But this isn't exactly a vulture. What do we got here? A hook. A hook. A hook. Which I found out by reading on this, in French, is called a falcon. Oddly enough. A hook. Ah, so, vultures. Anyways, Christ finished by calling those Pharisees vultures to their faces. Verse 37 calling them predators on the spiritually dead. And both commentators have very good points. However, Jesus was not referring to the Holy Spirit there at all. Rather, Jesus was referring to himself there. 
he was referring to the Son of Man in that context, and those Pharisees knew it. And those well-read Pharisees were well aware of that prophecy of the kingdom of the Son of Man from reading Daniel 7. They read the Old Testament, and they knew it forwards and backwards. And as claimed by Jesus, the kingdom of the Son of Man was certainly not all that observable to them yet or to anyone else, as we see in verse 20. That prophecy had not been completely fulfilled just yet. But at this point, I should tell you that within them, that within them translation, well, that was in your old NIV. It's not in your new NIV anymore. Gone. It's been translated a little better. The 2011, the new NIV, is a tremendous improvement. And as you will notice in your new NIV, it says, in your midst, rather than within them. And the Son of Man was indeed in their midst. Jesus was indeed in their midst. And translations are tricky. You have to rely on the context in order to translate properly. And according to our best lexicon, our BDAG lexicon, this account has invited much debate. That's what the lexicon says. It has invited much debate over the last century. And virtually all our translations are now departing from that overly strict uh, translation of within them. Departing since Ju Luke generally avoids reference to God's reign as a psychological reality. And since translating it, that woodenly would result in Emmanuel meaning God in us rather than God with us, which is ridiculous. And it is a claim made by witches with wooden heads. To repeat, this in your midst saying is not all that different from what we have already seen in chapters 10 and 11, where Jesus said the kingdom has come near to you and has come upon you, verses 11 and 20, since Jesus is that very kingdom. And to add to that, Jesus goes on at long length about his physical reality here, not psychological, it's physical, saying that he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation physically first, adding that when he finally returns in judgment, that physical fire and sulfur will rain down from heaven and destroy them all. Verse 29. And it will rain judgment upon you too, unless, of course, you are the repenting. Oh, repenting. We still have that prop. Repenting. I will have to repent. Oh, yay. Bang. All right. Unless you are the repenting and believing variety, unless you yield to that punchline, unless you are willing to lose your life for Christ's sake, in verse 33, in which case you will be lovingly taken elsewhere, verses 34 and 35, taken to the kingdom of God while the others get gobbled by the vultures. You see that picture, the graphic of the vultures in there. Not the hawk. We're talking vultures. Now you may be wondering where, where did verse 36 go in this? How come that's missing in your quiz book? Huh? Where's verse 36 here? Well, that was taken out of your NIV. Why? because it's commonly thought that King James manuscript borrowed that verse from Matthew. It's not in the better manuscripts. So that's why verse 36 is missing. 
But that incessant repenting and forgiving theme continues to dog us in this chapter as well. Verses 3 and 4. It continues to dog us as it dogged those dogs of Sodom that we read in verse 29. And it continues to dog us, not because we are forgetting, oh, where's Dory, that repenting and forgiving theme, <laughs> or not because it's all that hard to understand, but because it's very, very hard to repent. It's very hard to forgive. After all, can you imagine trying to forgive the same person seven times a day, as Jesus said to do? Yet, God can forgive even me seven times a day. Yep. God can forgive you seven times a day. And don't even bother thinking that you don't sin seven times a day. Because if you're thinking that, you are a Pharisee. Now prove our point. Let's prove the point right here. Let's look at the Tenth Commandment for a moment. The commandment that convicted Paul, if you recall, from Romans 7, verse 7. The commandment not to covet. So how often do you covet your neighbor's wife, house, pool, boat, car, snowblower? <laughs> not so much today, I guess. Power tools, iPhone, Xbox, data plan. Or as Pastor Joel mentioned this morning, who skates? Next, consider that I'm not talking about your next door neighbor here. <coughs> Ever watch TV? How much of that do you covet in commercials? But let's end this study on a more pleasant note. Let's talk about lepers. Oh, that sounds pleasant. <laughs> Something that would have delighted Dr. Luke immensely. What? And not because he was a physician, because he was a doctor. But because he was a foreigner, huh? That doesn't make sense. Yeah, because... It was. Well, it seems only the Samaritan foreigner returned to thank Jesus. Just like Luke was a foreigner. And only the dog... In, they were called dogs. Only the dog returned to thank Jesus. Which appealed to Luke because he was a foreigner. He was a dog himself. Whereas all those other misguided lepers, uh-uh, they returned to their native Jerusalem to visit the priest for what would normally be prolonged isolation and medical examination. But no isolation would be required this time since all signs of leprosy would be gone. Yet, a st still... Those lepers that went to the priest would still have to make a sacrifice. Yeah. Let me tell you about that sacrifice that those former lepers would have to make. They would have to take a live bird. Yes, a live bird. They would take this live bird and dip it into a dead bird's blood. Then they would take that live bird and they would sprinkle it on top of the leper. And then they would let this live bird go free. Yes. That's what they had to do. Now, do you see any symbolism there? Can you see the Passover in that bloody sacrifice? Can you see who that dead and live bird might be? Are you dead? Who would that live bird be? Who came to life? Yeah. However, the properly guided leper recognized that he was already freed by a much greater priest and he immediately turned around to praise God and thank Jesus instead. He gave a sacrifice of praise rather than a sacrifice of works, and we can be pretty confident that his leprosy never returned to him. But as for those other lepers, well, 
I suspect they got gobbled by the vultures. Gobbled by those priests. Vultures that we will see, we will see again in our next account, chapter 18, which talks about those vultures of works.